He's from MTV's Challenge, The Fresh Meat 2. Pete Connolly, thank you for joining me today, Pete. Thanks for having me, Mike. Appreciate it. All right. So, as you alluded to on Fresh Meat, you were a hockey guy growing up, and you were very competitive. Can you talk to me a little bit about your uh, early days, you know, interests, sports growing up? Yeah, yeah, sure. Um, so, I grew up playing pretty much every sport, you know, soccer, football, hockey, lacrosse. Um, my dad was a very good hockey player growing up. So, I mean, from the second that I could walk, he had me on skates. So that was kind of my main sport. But, um, you know, I played three sports in high school, um, football, hockey, lacrosse, but was captain of the, the uh, varsity hockey team junior and senior year. And I was the only freshman to make it my freshman year. So that was definitely um, definitely a passion of mine growing up. Um, big, big into sports and athletics. And then... Obviously, I like to have a good time, too. So when I went to college, I um, ended up playing on the club team at Loyola because they didn't have, like, a, an actual varsity team there. So it was good. You know, it's good to – I've always been someone that needs to be, you know, on a team and, and competing. Um, but I will tell you this. It did not <laughs> – did not prepare me for, uh, for, for the challenges whatsoever. <laughs> yeah, a so. lot of, uh, you know, other uh... – you know, things go into the challenge than, uh, you know, sports. <laughs> oh, yeah, dude. I had no idea. You, you got to keep like, in mind. Yeah. I never watched that stuff. Like, I really didn't watch MTV. I didn't – I really wasn't following that. So I did not know what I was getting myself into um, at all. <laughs> and I can get into that more as we talk. I mean, not so much when you were on, but I know with, like, some of the newer challenges. I mean, I mean, not saying, like, hockey, obviously. Hockey contributes to some aspects of it, but, like, with playing hockey, like that doesn't really prepare you to jump from like a car to car, like in no. the air. You know what I mean, no. like, there's some crazy stuff. No, not completely different. Like, you know, you're on the ice for for forty to forty to sixty seconds, and then you get a break, and then you're on the ice. I mean, some of those challenges, and it's interesting because a lot of the stuff we did on my season um, was very similar to a lot of the training that I did in the military when I ended up joining. So in that in that sense, you know, a lot of it's endurance based, um, and hockey is just that's not it's not not a good way to prepare for one of these challenges. Right. Um, so I spoke with Brandon and Vinny, who were uh, fellow fresh meets of yours recently, yeah. and we talked about uh, their casting processes. They both had two different uh, you know processes um, and uh, journeys to getting on the show. So I'm going to ask you, uh, what was your process kind of like, and like what how did you uh, hear get into it? Yeah, so um, I had a, a pretty unique casting process. Um, so I want to say it was my junior year of college. Um, I, I think at the time they had they were doing like you know op- they would have like open casting call advertisements on TV and stuff. And I think you know my roommates had MTV on, um, and I saw that. Long story short, they had an open casting call in Baltimore. Um, so we're like, you know what, let, let, might, might as well go. So I show up, and I'm sure these other guys told you, but you go in, and it's like a group interview. Um, so I'm sitting at this table, and in the lobby before they brought us in the back, there was this girl there, and I'll never forget her. She called herself Reality Renee, and she was a complete whack job. She had like a shoebox full of photos. She wouldn't stop talking to me, and I wanted nothing to do with this with this lady, right? And she's like, I've been, I've been trying to get on the show for six years, blah, blah, blah. I'm like, okay, whatever. You know, so we go in the room, they go around and they ask you the questions, you know, like, what's your name? What do people think about you? And I have, I'm sitting next to her and I have my cell phone on the table, right? And it's going around the room. It gets to her. She says some wacky thing. It gets to me and I'm in the middle of talking to the, the casting director, whoever's asking the questions. And she picks up my cell phone. She's like, hey, do you mind if I borrow your phone real quick? I was like, no. And I like snatched it. And I was like, listen, I was like, I, I appreciate, I can't remember her name. I was like, I, I appreciate the opportunity. I was like, I don't really want to be here. I was like, I, I have no interest, you know, on being on the show. I was like, so I'm, I'm just going to take off, you know? So I get up and I shook her hand and I get up and like, everyone's kind of looking at me and I, and I walk out. And as I walk out, um, this lady with like a headset on, she's like, Hey, uh, Peter, can you just, just hold on a second and wait for everyone to, to leave? I was like, yeah, sure. You know? So everybody walks out, and, and then the, the casting director that was asked the questions comes to me, and she's like, hey, would you mind coming back tomorrow and maybe, you know, doing like a, you know, an hour 
interview on tape and I'm like, yeah, sure. She's like, well, can you come in at nine or 10? This is a Saturday, right? And I was like, no. I was like, it happened to be the biggest party of the year that night. I was like, I'm probably, I can probably come in at two or three, you know? So I go out that night, you know, whatever. I show up the next day and it's at this really nice hotel in downtown Baltimore. And there's all these beautiful people and these nice clothes and, you know, dresses and these fancy jeans. And I'm in there in like mesh shorts, like a tank top, you know, and flip flops. Right. <laughs> Cause I don't know. Well, I don't really know like what's expected. So they bring me up and, um, you know, you sit in this hotel room that they've kind of turned into a little studio and there's a green screen and the camera and the woman from the day before is sitting there and she starts asking you questions, you know, the typical stuff, you know, what's your name? What do you do? Where are you from? All that. And then she goes, she's like, she starts asking me, she's like, so you're a real flirt, huh? She asks like, what's your ideal type of girl? And, and I'm telling her all this stuff. She's like, so how many, how many, um, how many girls have you been with? I was like, I'm not telling you that. How many guys have you been with? And she's (laughs) like, Whoa, you're feisty. I was like, I'm not telling you that, you know? So anyways, that was like an hour long and, uh, it wraps up and, and I leave and I'm like, I'm never going to hear from these people again. You know, like they, 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 they know I don't want to be there. They don't care. So school ends and I go, this is between junior and senior year. And I go to intern at this investment bank and about, I want to say two or three weeks into the summer, I get a phone call and every time they would call, it would be like weird numbers. It'd be like two, like four numbers on my phone. So I, I picked it up. Hey, is this Peter Conley? I said, yeah. And, uh, it was, you know, one of the folks from Buna Murray and I did a 30 minute phone interview. And again, after I hung up, I'm like, I'm never going to hear from these people again. But at this point now I'm researching the casting process and it's like, Oh, they're going to, they, they interview you seven or eight times. Then they fly you out to LA. And this was for real world DC. Right. So, so I'm like, okay. So another two weeks goes by. They get in touch with me and they're like, hey, would you mind doing a 30-minute Skype interview? I'm like, yeah, sure. So I'm sitting in my parents' living room, just like like me and you are, and but I can't see anybody. They have the screen blacked out. And okay. if there's like five or six people asking me questions. And we answer them and then at the end of it, they're like, okay, well, you know, thanks. How committed to, how committed are you to this? And, you know, at this point, I'm going to tell them whatever they want to hear because I had no intention of taking school off or leaving my job. I'm like, I'm 100 percent committed, like absolutely like 100 percent. I'll leave school Um, because, again, I don't think that I to me, it's a joke. There's no way I'm going to get on this show. So that happens. And then I'm at work and I get a phone call from my mom. Now, this is like another two weeks has gone by. She calls me and she goes, hey, I opened up a piece of mail. I thought it was for your dad. It's like a 90-page contract from Buddha Murray. She's like, you might want to come home and take a look at this. I said, okay. So I go home and I'm looking through this contract. And I'm like, I mean, you're like signing your life away to these people for two years. Like your image, you can't change your image. Like just some really, really ridiculous like um, clauses in there. Like you won't hold them liable if you catch an STD while in their employ. Uh, I mean, so... So my dad's part business partner at the time was a lawyer. So I had him read it over and he's like, listen, he goes, you're not gonna be able to negotiate this. He goes, there's a hundred thousand kids that would sign this in a second. He goes, and on, on, on the front of it, I remember it said like, this does not guarantee you to be a cast member. Right. So I, I'm like, whatever I sign it, I send it back. Um, and then I want to say about a week later, I'm out. It was like Friday night. And I'm at the bar with a couple friends and I get a phone call from this girl, Nas Navab, who was one of the like production assistants. She's like, Hey, Hey Pete, this is, you know, so-and-so from Buna Murray. Congratulations. You've been selected as the newest cast member on the real world road rules challenge. And I was like, what? Yeah. Okay. She's like, do you want to do it? I'm like, Oh yeah, absolutely. Like I'm a hundred percent in keep in mind. I'm, I've been, you know, I've, I've had a couple drinks, so I'm like excited and, I hang up the phone, buy shots for everyone at the bar, and I wake up the next morning and I'm like, wait a second. I was like, I I can't, I I gotta, I gotta think about this, right? So I call her back and I'm like, hey, I was like, I gotta talk to some people. I'm like, can you give me like a week um, and I'll get back to you guys? And she's like, we'll give you 24 hours. She's like, this is a once in a lifetime opportunity, you know, and they're they're selling me on it, right? So I call this, I call Loyola 
and they're like, yeah, you can take a leave of absence. No problem. You can, you can come back and, and finish up. Um, I call the CEO of the investment bank I was working for because they had offered me a job when I graduated. And he said, yeah, Pete, he goes, I think it's a great experience. He's like, just don't, don't say or do anything that, that, you know, would embarrass you or your family. Um, he goes, and there's a job here, you know, when you graduate. So I got basically blessed off by everyone and I called her back and I said, yeah, I'm in. Um, and she was like, great. (laughs) So, um, it was very, it was definitely odd at the time because you got to remember, dude, this is like, this whole process took like four months. I never sent them videos. Like I never did any of that stuff. And I think the reason they picked me was because I did not care and I didn't want to do it at all. And like all these other people, like when I got to the actual show, like some of these dudes, like, you know, Vinny Brandon, like Tara Maria, like it was, that was like their dream was to get on MTV. Like that was the pinnacle of what they wanted to do. For me, it was like, man, I wanted to be an investment banker and like make a ton of money. Like TV was not in the cards for me, but it was something that I couldn't, I couldn't turn down. Um, so that's how I ended up getting casted for the show. Wow, that's nuts. That's that's <laughs> yeah. definitely uh, I've never heard that before. Yeah, dude, never. it was it was weird. Yeah. Wow. So were you glad that um you got skipped straight to the challenge or would you have liked to uh, experience the real world? You know, I'll I'll, uh, I'll be honest. I um looking back on it now, I'm glad that I did a challenge because if I had ended up on real world DC, I had like a crew of buddies in Baltimore and all, in in my opinion, all the real world is dude. It's a bunch of people living in a house getting hammered. You know, all the drama you see is when people are drunk. Um, honestly, like long-term doesn't really do me a whole lot. Um, I'm sure if, if I had, wanted to make a career and really leverage the exposure that it would have given me, then like, yeah, I would have done it. Like you look at guys like, you know, Kenny and Wes and and Johnny and CT. I mean, these dudes have made a career out of this. Um, Yeah. It just wasn't something at the time that, that I really had thought about. So I was happy to do the challenge because I liked the physical aspect of it. I felt it was a little more like, yeah, but it's really more about competition and who's the best um, and who can win, you know? Right. Um, so obviously, being a fresh meet, um, you guys are getting picked by the veterans that were there. Um, Jillian ended up picking you. Were you uh, glad that she picked you or were you hoping for uh, someone else? Uh, I'll be honest, dude. I had no idea who any of these people were, really. Um, other than I knew who Danny was because he was a Boston guy. Um and I knew who Jen was, but I didn't make the connection. I had seen something on ESPN when I was in high school about, like, the youngest ever Oakland cheerleader. So I was up there, man. I just wanted to get picked. Um, I did not. I knew I didn't want to get I, – I think – I know I didn't want Caitlin to pick me because somebody uh, – I was like, I didn't, I didn't want her as a partner. Um, but, I mean, I didn't care, dude. I was just like, okay, whatever, you know. Um, whoever it is, it is. I, I was glad – I didn't know Jill, but I was glad that <laughs> I was glad yeah. that somebody picked me because we thought if you didn't get picked, like someone was going to go home. Because oh, remember, wow. like nobody picked Luke, yeah, so we Luke, thought he yeah. was done. Yeah. So we were all just like, "Man, somebody please pick me." Right. No, but you definitely, um, I'd say, ended up on the uh, you know better end of the stick. Jillian had previously won a season, uh, you know, before that, so wasn't uh, the, you know the worst option in the world. You know, you guys did well. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I will tell you, um, you know, I didn't like the the whole combine thing was, was a joke. Like, you know, they're trying to make you run like a 40 and the the, the ground is sloped and you know, all this other stuff. It was like these dude, we're not jumping three feet in the air. No, none of us are doing that. We don't got ups like that. And that's like, if you look, I used to have all the the books and everything from it. I don't know where they all went. It's been like 10 years, (laughs) but they, they, you know, they, 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 drafted us based off those numbers and they don't mean anything so it was interesting because when we first got there i know brandon and i'm sure vinnie told you you know we thought we were going to this house and uh and we end up in an army tent you know with cots in the middle of a field in, in canada somewhere um but when we showed up to the house it was like okay this is this is pretty legit 
but I'll be honest with you, man. Like I would wake up every morning there and I'd be like, what, what am I doing here? Like, this is, <laughs> this, is this is insane, dude. I mean, yeah. the first night there and, and keep in mind, like you're, you're listening to these stories that all these veterans are telling you. And I mean, it's, it's, they're wild stories about like appearances. And some of these people have been doing this for five, six years. And you're just kind of like sitting there listening to all this. And I mean, I think they all expected like the fresh meat to do whatever they said. And like, I just, they don't, they didn't air a lot of it, but like, I kind of did my own thing. Like I, I shook hands with Kenny, like probably the first week. And I was like, listen, bro, I was like, I got your back. If you got mine this whole time. Yeah. And, uh, and they don't show a lot of that, but like me and him were, were pretty tight through it. And, uh, and I mean, we both ended up making it to the finals. Um, and, and it was good because that, that was the way I played. Like I didn't, I didn't play the whole backstabbing bullshit and, you know, they kept, they tried to vote me, me and Jill in like every single time, you know? Right. Um, which was, that was interesting. The first challenge. <laughs> yeah. We get back, we get back to the house and Jill's like, don't worry about it. We're good. I'm like, okay. You know, cause I don't know what's going on. And we're sitting there at, at you know, outside in, in that little area and they're going around and, and they're saying everyone's name and no one's raising their hand. And then. Somebody goes, Jill and Pete, and everybody raises their hand. And I'm like, I look at her, I was like, I thought you said we were good. <laughs> you know? Right. And, of course, they put us in against Darrell and Cara Maria. So, first round draft pick for the girl. And this dude, Darrell, I'm being told, has never lost Four a challenge. Times. In his, Four yeah, in never row. lost a challenge in his life yeah. on elimination. So, I'm like, you got to be kidding me. Like, I took a semester off of school to come here for a week, I'm like, my parents are going to kill me. Like, like this is awful. Like I, I can't go home. So we show up to the elimination and it's like a six mile ruck, you know, where they give you, it was like a Jan sport backpack with like 60 pounds in it for the guys and 40 for the girls. And you got to solve these puzzles along the way. And they give you this map that was garbage. And they're, they're like, okay, you know, they blow the horn and go. And like I told you before, I had not trained for this, man. Like, I wasn't a big runner. You know, I was a hockey player, right? I had hockey muscles. I, I didn't, I, I wasn't prepared to be running through, you know, the woods. And so we get like, I want to say halfway through this thing, and there's a tanagram puzzle, right? And these things are so easy, man. It, it, it's like, they're not hard. It's like, it's like a kid's, like a, a fifth grader's puzzle. So we drop the, we drop our packs down, we get some water and I fill this thing in real quick and I look over and I see Cara Marie and Darrell and they're like struggling with this puzzle. So I, the only time you know where you are is when you pass the other people. So I know that we're kind of ahead of them now. Right. And we're going and now Jill can't carry her bag anymore. Right. So I'm like, just give me the bag. And I mean, I yell, I screamed at her the whole time, man. Wow. It was like the funniest, the producers thought it was the funniest thing like they're like you guys are like an old married couple and they didn't show a lot of it but i was i was like screaming at her so i take her bag and i put it on the front so now i got a hundred pounds of gear on right and i'm like absolutely smoked and i'm just i'm just going man like one foot in front of the other just trying to get there because i don't want to go home right and there's a camera filming me and i'm like i can't i cannot fail and for some reason or another man I like stumble across this finish line, like fall down or whatever. I, maybe that was when I went against Danny and I, we beat Darrell and Cara Maria and I'm like, Oh my God, this, this is crazy. And I go back to the house and everybody goes nuts, man. Like I remember getting out of the van and everyone was up on the deck and, uh, they're just, they're going nuts. Um, so that was a, that was a good feeling. Like when you win some of those eliminations, it's, it's pretty cool, but I'll be honest, like that gave me a taste of what was to come later in my life when I, when I went through, um, you know, selection, um, in the military, right. because, you know, we were regularly running around with like 65 to hundred pounds of gear, you know, for 10, 12 miles. So it was, um, it, it was, it was interesting, man. It, it definitely, uh, it definitely pushed me at the time to my limits. Um, but you know, I was also 21. Like I, I didn't know much about life at that point. Right. Yeah, but um, that was at the time, and still even, they just, um, I think the Challenge YouTube uh, page made, like, a video recently. It might have been a few months ago. It was, um, like, either 
top 10 biggest upsets or like top 10 biggest wins or something like that. And um, yours, uh, your elimination win over uh, Darrell and Carr was on there. Because you got to remember, Darrell at the time, obviously, as you mentioned, like never lost. And Carr, yeah. I mean, Carr obviously went on to be probably now, I'd say, like the female uh, face of the franchise, sort of. So. Yeah, it's it's so, I, I mean, I, I'll be honest with you, man. It's so, it's so funny to me because she wanted to be there more than anybody. And I remember, I remember her bawling her eyes out when when they lost you know because like this was supposed to be her sh- her big shot you know and, and i'll be honest with you i didn't i didn't really get along with her all that well um like i remember looking at her like thinking like who is this chick she looks like jack sparrow and i remember telling her that. she's like oh thank you i'm like but you ride horses and you're from methuen like what like what i, I just it, d- it didn't make sense to me right. and then you know 10 years later like you said she's like the face of the franchise um and, it, and it's interesting because I think back on that, you know, I was supposed to go to Prague. I mean, they probably called me for the next three or four seasons after, and I and and we can get into it, but, like, I turned them down um, because, you know, basically my boss. So uh, I'll, let me take a step back. So I do fresh meat, too, right? I come in third place, and I'm dating Jen, right? Right. Which, <laughs> which was which was interesting in and of itself. I'd never had a girlfriend before, and then I go on a TV show and come back with a reality, you know, TV star girlfriend, um, which was awesome, man. I mean, it, we we had a we had a good time, um, but then they said, okay, hey, do you want to do uh, you want to go to Prague? And I'm like, absolutely, you know. So two weeks before I'm supposed to graduate. They're getting everything ready, and I'm, I'm like, okay, in my mind, I'm like, all right, yeah, I'm going to go. And I was like, but I'm not going unless, you know, Jen goes. So they get her on it, too. Um, and then I pulled out, like, a week before we were supposed to leave. And uh, I remember I called the CEO of the bank. I was like, hey, do you mind if I start, like, six or seven weeks late? And he was like, why? And I was like, well, MTV asked me to do another show. And he goes, Pete, he goes, one time is an experience. He goes, excuse my, pardon my language, he goes, he goes, you do it again. He goes, you're whoring yourself out to MTV. He goes, I can't promise there'll be a job here for you when you get back. I said, all right. There goes my, I got that, that's my, at that time, being an investment banker was like my primary goal in life. And that's what I had worked towards for so long. Not to say that being on a challenge, man, and, and, and the attention that you get when you're, you know, college kid on TV. I mean, yeah, it's, it's cool, bro. Like, yeah, it, it's cool. Um, anybody that tells you that they that they don't like the attention, it's a he's a liar. Um, you know, like I tried to be as humble as I could about it. Like I, I really didn't leverage it all that much. I mean, I deleted all my social media accounts and stuff. But yeah, dude, it, it was uh, it was definitely an experience. And um, you know, it, it pop, even today it pops up. I remember when I showed up to my first unit, they had printed out pictures that they had found online of me, and they had posted it like all over the squadron. Sure. And, and it was just like, you know, they'll, they'll, they'll rag on you for everything. So it was, uh, it was, it was interesting. But in terms of business, like they gave me a great edit. They didn't make me look like an idiot. Um, I mean, everything that I wanted to get out of it, I did. Um, you know, I look back on it now. Do I wish I kind of, do I wish I had done some, some more shows? Yeah. You know, cause I still ended up joining the military anyways. <laughs> yeah. You know what I mean? Like, uh, right. I didn't care. So it's, um, but it was a good experience, dude. It, it was, it's definitely a once, once in a lifetime story to tell people. That's for sure. And, you know, I still stay in touch with, uh, I saw Wes a few months ago. Um, he runs a pretty successful business now and I work for a large international bank. Um, so I flew up to Kansas city and sat down with him and introduced him to some of our executives. So he's a really, really smart guy. And, uh, Again, he has he's he's leveraged the challenge and that exposure to the maximum benefit that he can. Yeah, he's at it. He's on the season. I don't know if you heard him and Johnny. Um, they're in a two man power trip right now. Yeah. Fun came together. Yeah, I think I saw um, something on Instagram. You know, from one of the two of them. You know, like yeah. teaming up. Um, yeah, because they just, were always at each other's throats for uh, the, their entire careers, and then they uh, they both went out early on the last season, 
And then um, I think they were on the same bus or whatever, like heading uh, home after being eliminated. And we're like, look, the new generation's coming. Like, we're never going to, neither of us are going to win a challenge if we keep going at each other. So, like, we have to, like, team up. There's, like, no other, uh, you know, way to go about it at this point. Yeah, yeah. I mean, hey, those, uh, you know, I want to, I think I I met Johnny, like, once or twice. I was in New York with uh with a bunch of people um we would always go to new york and stay at like paula and ryan's house because they they had an apartment together so the last time i saw most of these guys it was like me me jen ryan paula like sandy mandy there's like a bunch of us staying at their apartment in new york and we would go out and party and i think i went out to dinner with johnny and uh I mean, dude, he, he's like, he's turned this thing into, he's got his own show on like, what, CBS or NBC or something like NBC, yeah, NBC. like, look. dude, that good for you, man. Like if, if that's, if you want to be on TV, um, and that's, that's your goal, like the, the challenge in the real world is a good platform, um, to kind of build a, a, a base of fans to, to do that. It's just, again, it just wasn't, <laughs> this wasn't something I ever saw myself doing, man. <laughs> So I'm going to ask you now, um, obviously, you know, in my opinion, uh, the Fresh Meat 2 house has to be one of my favorites, like the house itself. Um, what was your uh, initial reaction upon arriving and seeing that's where you're going to live? So let, let me let me put it to you this way. Absolutely gorgeous house, man. I mean, it, like... When I found out I got on the show, I started watching some of it to kind of like, you know, watching game film, like, hey, what, what, what did I just get myself into here? So I knew that they were nice houses. I mean, this thing was like a $7 million log cabin mansion, um, just beautiful backdrop. You know, every shower was a steam room when you pushed a button. But there's 26 people living in this place, dude. Like, it's gross. <laughs> and I remember I went in there and I found the smallest room I could with the least amount of people. It was like me, Vinny, Brandon, and I can't remember who the third, the fourth person was, but we had like two bunk beds and it was just us in this little tiny room. Everyone else was living in these huge ones with tons of people in them. I just, I, I didn't, I didn't want to do that. With that being said, like kind of where I, where I grew up, um, and like where I used to go vacation, like I had seen homes like that before. So like where some people may have not been exposed to that before to me, I was like, I mean, don't get me wrong. Absolutely gorgeous place, but it wasn't like mind blowing. I wasn't like, Oh my God, this is the nicest place I've ever been. And I've never seen anything like this before, but I have heard um, from other people that that was like the best, that was the best house that, that they'd ever had. Wow. Yeah. Um, so I'm going to ask you, cause this is, um, one of like, I'd say the most, um, you know, well-known kind of argument fights, um, kind of like you weren't really technically involved in the fight, but I'd say the fight kind of stemmed around, um, your potatoes. <laughs> Bro, they cut that, they cut that whole scene out of what actually happened. Okay. Uh, yeah. Let's so, see. so I don't know what it was at the time, dude, but I would make these like hash browns, dude. And it would take me like 40, 50 minutes and I would. You know, I'd, I'd get drunk and then I would go make them, right? And everybody in the house knew about it. So I'm there and I'm cooking my potatoes, you know, minding my own business. Um, you know, it's a big kitchen and I spend like 40 minutes and I cook up these potatoes and I go to sit down to eat them. And I'm sitting there and Danny is like obliterated, like blackout drunk, sloppy. And I, I have a very low tolerance for people that can't hold their liquor. So I'm just sitting there, like, kind of crouched over, like, eating my potatoes. And all of a sudden, his just big, grimy hand comes, and he just grabs a handful of my potatoes, right? Now, what they don't show is I grabbed his hand, and I stabbed him in the hand with a fork. Wow. And he lets the potatoes go, and I stand up, and I shove him and smash his head off of the, the countertop, right? And I sit back down. But the producer was in the shot the entire time. So when he, when you see it, if you watch it, he stands back up and he's got this big red mark across his, head, yeah. his face. Just, that's he was what that at, and it was that off. Was, that, that. Yeah, yeah, that's what that was from, dude. Right. So, so I'm standing there and I'm like, in my mind, I'm like, I should just, I should just smoke this guy, you know, like just throw punch him and drop him. But I'm like, 
they had told us at the time, they're like, if you lay a finger on anyone, like they're going to kick you out. Right. So I'm like, like free, like in freaking out inside. I'm like, whatever. So I sit back down and I, I eat, I start eating my potatoes. And then for whatever reason, Danny starts going after like Brandon because brand or, or Sandy and like Brandon gets involved. And then like, you know, we, then the whole thing happened. And so it stemmed around me and the potatoes with Danny. And, you know, and the next day he apologized. I mean, dude, people do dumb stuff when they're, when they're drunk, but they cut that whole scene out, man. Like they didn't show any of it. And it's because the angle of where the camera crew, the producer would have been in the shot the whole time. And I don't know why they didn't like. I'm surprised that they didn't like try and oh, okay. like kick me out because like yeah, you know I I laid hands on him, um, but they didn't. <laughs> they, they didn't they really give you a anything. warning. No, no man. warning. Wow. No. They mean, did find me though. They so I didn't know this. Like you know when you're I can't remember. It was like Monday was a challenge. Tuesday was exile. Like Wednesday was an interview day. So like the first interview day. You know, they, they bring you to like a hotel and they have like all the interview stuff set up and like they make you wait in the lobby. And I was like, man, screw this. Like, I'm gonna go out for a walk, you know? So I'm like walking around like, like Whistler village doing my thing. And all of a sudden I see like two or three producers and they're like, what are you doing? I was like, I'm just going for a walk. And they're like, you can't do that. Like you need to come back with us right now. Right. So I go back and they ended up finding me like a week's worth of pay. Because I had like broken the rules and like run off on my own. <laughs> wow. Yeah, so that's that's kind of what you're. Uh, it's almost almost like you're um, stuck there, right? You can't leave, right? Is that what I? No, that's what I heard. Yeah, you can't do anything, bro. Like you're stuck in the house. You can't. You, you there's no music. There's there's no TV. Um, like they take all the doors off the house. They don't shut the lights off until like everybody's asleep. Um. You know, so it, it's kind of like they control everything. And then every day, if I remember correctly, at four, they would come in and they would like stock the place full of booze. Right. And okay. they would, they started dying like all the clear liquor. They put like red or blue dye in it because people would fill up like pull and spring bottles and like, you know, drink it at a challenge. Like yeah. just because there's nothing else to do besides like drink and interact with each other. Luckily, there was a pool table there. And I had like gone through the house and found some like random books that they they hadn't like confiscated um, because a lot of the time, dude, you're just there like killing time. Like you're just yeah. sitting there, like you don't want to talk to somebody, so you're like laying in bed. And if you don't have anything to read or do, like you're just stuck there. Mm -hmm. um, so. so, who would you say you kind of resonated most with, like when you first got there? Um, honestly, like I I like Brandon a lot, man. Like I I. Uh, when we were on that little like prop plane, I started talking with him. Um, I, I, I definitely res obviously, obviously, uh, you know, Jen and Ryan, um, which was interesting. Cause like, I never really had friends like that before. Um, and then Kenny, but like, you know, I, I didn't, I wouldn't say that I, I was super close with anybody. Um, you know, Wes, like me and him would have like uh, like twenty four hour party truces, you know, because he was a frat dude from ASU. Like he liked to party, I liked to party. Um, but uh, yeah, man, I, I would probably say I probably say those folks, um, you know. But you got to realize at the time, you know, I was the youngest kid on the show. I just turned twenty one. You're in this unique experience in this house with people, and you're like, man, these guys. I'm going to be friends with these people forever. This is a once in a lifetime thing. Like no one else is going to understand. And I want to say, like, after a year, like I, I really, I stayed in touch with some guys, um, you know, Kenny, Ryan, and all those other folks I told you about. But after that, man, like I kind of lost touch with everybody. Right. Um, what was your relationship like with Darrell and Landon? Uh, so I always Darrell. I didn't have really any relationship with at all obviously he was there for like two nights before right. he went home landon on the other hand um again a lot of stuff that they don't air you know he he was a straight shooter i respect that dude like he was a he he's a competitive athlete through and through um he came to me a couple times when i was in the shower and he was like hey he goes will, will you vote this way or that way you know if i do this or that and i was like no you know, so 
he was he was one of those guys that like you know he, he played the game um i felt really bad when uh when i when i you know basically threw him in to elimination mm-hmm. um but what that did was basically break up Wes and Evelyn's little plan. I mean, their whole he, Wes ran that house, dude, and we like picked his alliance apart piece by piece. Yeah, you know. Uh huh. Um, was there anything that uh, obviously, aside from the Danny thing that you mentioned, was there anything else that you thought uh, wasn't shown that should have made TV? Um, you know. Not, I, I did. You got to remember, this is like ten years yeah. ago. Uh-huh. Um, you know, not not off the top of my head. I mean, there was times like I used to do this thing where I, you know, I would like, uh, you know, you get up on a table and like, you know, shotgun a beer and do chants and stuff. They just they didn't show a whole lot of the um, the partying. Like, I mean, we 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 were having a good time, man. Because again, there's really not a whole lot to do. Um, if you're not, if you're not partying, um, and it's funny because all, I remember telling my buddies, like when you see people dancing and these theme parties that we would have, there's no music. This is just people like having a good time or like banging on a table, like singing along to their own beat. I mean, it is, I don't know if it's changed now. Um, but no, I mean, I, I can't think of, I can't think of anything, um, that, that they should have, that they should have aired that didn't make TV. Um, if ever given the chance, uh, could you ever envision yourself coming back? You know, it's interesting that you said that. Um, so when I got off the challenge, you know, I, I worked in investment banking for like four or five years and then I ended up enlisting in the air force, um, and became a, an EOD technician, which is explosive ordnance disposal. And, uh, it's about, you know, a, a year and a half long training pipeline, it's like got like an eighty percent attrition rate. Um, it was hard, man. It was the hardest hardest thing I've ever done in my life, and also the the most rewarding. So I uh, I did that for about five years, and I had two hip surgeries. So uh, I I went out to dinner with Wes, like like I said six months ago, and I was talking to him because the training that I've kind of gone through now and. I know where my limits are. Like I, I would do, I would probably do one more show, but it would like completely destroy my body because my, my joints are just done from, from the military. Um, but I would do it. And I know, I think he actually reached out to the, uh, the producer and was like, Hey, I got this guy here. Um, Pete, you know, he's on fresh meat too. Like you should look at him and, and hit him up. Um, but not, nothing ever came of that. I just, I don't know. I don't think my family would like it. Um, you know, I'm, I'm married now. Um, my wife is like absolutely amazing. I don't think she, I think she would like to see it. You know, she's like, you should, you should go back. You'd kick everyone's ass, blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, you know, I, I mean, I, I, I guess, but I also just don't want to be put like that spotlight, man. It, it's, um, it, it can be like a curse and a blessing, especially like with the career that I have now. You know, it's, it's, unless they gave me like an outlandish amount of money, it probably wouldn't be worth it other than to see if I still have what it takes. Right. Um, so what have you, uh, been up to? Obviously I know you said you're in, uh, you enlisted into the Marines, but what have you, uh, been up to since, uh, we last saw you on television? Yeah. So like I said, so it was actually, it was the air force. Um, oh. so I got out, I got out of the air force. Um, well, I guess while I was in. Uh, I did some missions with like the secret service and a bunch of range clearances down, like on the border of Mexico. I mean, I was getting paid dude, to literally like blow stuff up for the government. It was, wow. it was like every little kid's dream. Um, <laughs> and, uh, and then when I got out, so I got out in May, so about a, almost a year ago now. And, uh, I got recruited to work for uh, JP Morgan. So I work for them now, um, on their, uh, multinational commercial banking team living here in Dallas, you know, I've got, just bought a, bought a house. I've got a German shepherd, a cat and my wife, Siobhan, We've been married for, for three years. Um, no kids, but, uh, you know, man, we're just, we're just enjoying life right now, dude. Like I, I really can't complain everything, everything that happened, like it worked out great. Like I never, I never thought I would get married, dude, ever. 
Like, I mean, I, I just, I, I walked into this bar, well, it was a bar restaurant one night, and I see this girl sitting at a table, right, by herself. And I'm like, oh my God. And there's no guys around her. So I like walk around the bar and I, and I look at her and she's like squinting at me and I start laughing. And so I go over to walk over and introduce myself. She gets up to run away. And I'm like, I go, I'm like, hey, hey, what, hey, I'm, I'm, I'm Pete, you know? And she sits there, she's like, well, hey, what's up? And I end up talking to her for 40 minutes. She's like, oh, you're never going to call me again if I give you my number, blah, blah, blah. I was like, I promise I will call and text you every day, you know? And long story short, we end up, um, my, my current wife, Siobhan, and, uh, you know, we ended up getting married in Lake Tahoe. And um, she came out when I was stationed in Phoenix. And so she, she stuck with me, you know, through my enlistment and like all the surgeries and everything. And, and now we're here. Um, so it's, it's been good, bro. It's, uh, it's, it's been a good, it's been a good ride. That's awesome, man. Yeah. I'm happy for you. Thanks, bro. Um, so I'm going to wrap up with the last question. Um, so obviously, as you know, the coronavirus being a huge thing now, it's kind of, you know, forced people to shift their uh, gears a little bit. Um, how has it kind of, uh, forced you to adjust, you know, your normal day to day schedule? Uh, I mean, dude, it's completely turned, um, like my day to day life completely upside down. So, uh, you know, I was going into the office every day. Like I think I told you before, this is, this will be my ninth week working from home. So, you know, I live nine minutes from the office, but we're not allowed to go into it. Um, so that, that's kind of one of the biggest things. Um, my wife had a dog walking business that she had started and it was flourishing obviously with everyone working from home, there's no need for a, a dog walker to come walk. So, you know, that business, um, kind of, um, disintegrated as a result. Uh, my grandmother who probably would have lived to a hundred, you know, she got COVID in a nursing home and passed away. Um, so it's, it's definitely had a, a, a significant impact, um, on my life and my family. Luckily I haven't gotten it and my wife hasn't gotten it yet. Um, but I mean, I'm sure you've seen some of these folks out there, man, that they're like, the virus isn't real. Yeah. It's like, dude, it's real. Like there's people out there every day putting their life on the line to make sure, um, that folks are getting the care that they need, you know? So the least, I think the least we can do, you know, um, as a society is like, have some respect for that, you know, and, and everyone's entitled to their own opinions, but you know, just, just wear a mask and some gloves and wash your hands, <laughs> you know? Yeah. Dude, it's crazy. My uh, county that I'm living in is the number one county in uh, Jersey, actually, of uh, cases. Yeah, it's wild, dude. It's um, that's scary. I mean, and the thing is, it's not, it's not just like killing the older population. There's people my age and your age, dude, that are like having strokes, and, yeah. and they're just like they're just dying, you know. And it's like, you know, I, I'll be honest. I never thought I would make it to thirty. Um, you know, I'm 32, but like, I don't, I don't particularly want to die from COVID. You know what I mean? Like yeah. <laughs> I'd rather, I'd rather die jumping out of a plane and my parachute doesn't open. You know what I mean? <laughs> but yeah. not, not sick in a hospital bed. Right. Uh, well, it was you know? a pleasure speaking with you, Pete and, uh, having you on today. Yeah, man. Thank you. I, I really appreciate it. And, uh, you know, good luck to, good luck to you and everything that you're doing, bro. Thank you, man. Well, uh, stay safe, uh, you and your family and uh, take care. You as well. See ya. See ya.